So this video covers the beginning of Act 3 of A Doll's House, which is the conversation between Mrs. Lind and Krogstad that we were anticipating uh, at the end of the previous act. Mrs. Lind, if you remember, had gone out to try and intercede with Krogstad to plead on Nora's behalf, but had come back, had been unable to actually meet with him, and it had instead left him a note to try and see him the evening after. This scene then, as you will see, um, is the evening after the day before, after that day. Now, in terms of the structure of this uh, section of the play, the important thing to do um, is to think about the fact that the plot still now is resting on this kind of peripetia moment, on the cusp of this turning point. And there are two options for which direction it could go. If this play were to end like a tragedy, then we would expect to see the destruction of Nora and her marriage and perhaps her life. Uh, in other words, we would expect events to go downhill. Now, if on the other hand, this were to be more like a well-made play, like the prevailing type of play in the 19th century, then we would expect there to be some kind of neat and convenient resolution. It would all end happily. But at this point, it's still in the balance. We can't see which way it will go. Let's begin then. The same scene. The table has been placed in the middle of the stage with chairs round it. A lamp is burning on the table. The door into the hall stands open. Dance music is heard in the room above. Mrs. Lind is sitting at the table, idly uh, uh, turning over the leaves of a book. She tries to read, but does not seem able to collect her thoughts. Every now and then she listens intently for a sound at the outer door. So, what's worth noting here? Well, the fact that this is the same scene again reminds us of what we've said about the sheer claustrophobia of this text. The fact that all the action that we see takes place in the one room, reminding us, of course, about the nature of womanhood, and particularly the nature of Nora's life, how trapped, how restricted she has been by it and by society's expectations on it. And, of course, those expectations of society are very much personified, to some extent, in the character of uh, her husband, and perhaps even more in the threats that Krogstad makes to reveal her, um, her crime. Now, um, what else then? The dance music is a reference to the party above. Um, remember, because this is a middle class uh, household and because it's more common in Scandinavia, that even quite wealthy people would live in quite large apartments in buildings with other people. So the party that they've gone to is seemingly uh, upstairs from their own flat. Um, in terms of the character of Mrs. Lynn, then, um, Quite obviously she is worried, i.e. clearly she hasn't heard back from Krogstad in terms of whether or not he will help Nora. Um, and you look at the evidence there, you know, she's idly turning the leaves of a book. She tries to read, but cannot collect her thoughts. She's listening intently. She's worried, she's nervous. And of course we share that too. The direction that this play uh, will go in, or can go in, is still in the balance. The next stage direction that she looks at her watch um, and the various ones in this section, the listeners again, goes into the hall and opens the outer door carefully. All of these things um, only further add testament to her nerves. I suppose we could also reflect these nerves to uh, the nature or the status of her as um, a woman of um, limited financial means, therefore of quite, an, um, quite a precarious circumstances in life. So we begin then. Mrs. Lind looks at her watch and says, Not yet, and the time is nearly up. If only he does not... See the fragment there, the kind of interruption, the pause. And then in relief she continues, Ah, there he is. And she goes into the hall and opens the outer door carefully. Light footsteps are heard on the stairs and she whispers, Come in, there is no one here. Krogstad appears in the doorway. I found a note from you at home. What does this mean? It is absolutely necessary that I should have a talk with you. Really? And is it absolutely necessary that it should be here? 
Now, from the structural point of view of Ibsen as a dramatist, it's absolutely necessary that it should be here because, of course, it emphasises the sort of prison nature of this room. Um, but from the point of view of um, Mrs. Lind, um, it's interesting because, again, I suppose it emphasises her kind of dependence, her new dependence on the Helmer family for job, money and livelihood. But it continues on. She says, It is impossible where I live. There is no private entrance to my rooms. Further evidence there again about the precariousness of her situation. Uh, come in. We are quite alone. The maid is asleep and the Helmers are at the dance upstairs. I should probably also say there um, that if you want to talk about lower status characters in this play, particularly lower status female characters, you could also group this information about Mrs. Lind with, for example, the nurse that we met at the beginning of Act 2. Now, you could also, if you wanted to make a structural point here, mention that it's interesting that those two acts... Um, well, in fact, actually, if we include Act 1, um, the, all three acts begin with the presentation of these female characters who are each in their way weakened um, by social circumstances. I suppose we can argue that that really sort of um, foregrounds what we can see as Ibsen's rather proto-feminist views about um, the situation of women and his desire to present it, to challenge the uh, status quo, if you like, the way that things were at that time, um, with a view to social reform. Continues then. Krogstad says, as he com comes into the room, are the Helmers really at a dance tonight? She replies, yes, why not? And he, assuming that she does not know, replies, why not? I think he is surprised because I think he expects that Tor Torvald will by now know about what Nora has done and therefore he's surprised that they would be doing something as seemingly frivolous as a dance. For him, I think it's further evidence almost of a decadence of middle-class people like Nora and Torvald. The fact that their lives seem to exist in this vacuum with such disregard for the um, well-being or the interests or the care of others that has led, for example, to characters like, Torv uh, like Krogstad having such a difficult life up to this point. It continues then. She says, now, Nils, let's have a talk. Of course, it's interesting that immediately she refers to him by his first name, Nils Krogstad. There's an indication there, then, isn't there, um, which may have been intimated to us before, that these two characters also have a history, that they, too, um, have got um, a backstory that is going to become relevant. In fact, of course, we find out, in fact, that they were previously lovers, but that uh, they were unable to marry for financial reasons. But let's continue. So, Krogstad rather bitterly says, Can we, too, have anything to talk about? She replies, We have a great deal to talk about. I shouldn't have thought so. No, you have never properly understood me. Was there anything else to understand except what was obvious to all the world? A heartless woman jilts a man when a more lucrative chance turns up. And there now we have it. Mrs. Lynde was forced to marry what seemed like a richer man than Krogstad in order to guarantee the financial safety of her own family. Again, there's a powerful message here about the status of women forced to make economic choices rather than purely romantic ones to think about the well-being and the happiness of others before themselves. So really, what we're talking about here is this immense sacrifice from Mrs. Lind that at the moment, Krogstad doesn't fully appear to understand. Mrs. Lind answers, Do you really believe I am as absolutely heartless as all that? And do you believe that I did it with a light heart? Didn't you? Niels, did you really think that? If it were as you say... Why did you write to me as you did at the time? I could do nothing else. As I had to break with you, it was my duty also to put an end to all that you felt for me. Now, pause that then. So, in other words, when Mrs. Lynde had to make her decision, she clearly took the, again, quite noble decision to um, 
speak to, uh, or rather to write to Crocodile and to, um, and to sort of um, make him hate her, as it were, in order that uh, it would help him to get over it. That was obviously the intention uh, there that she had. Um, so again, we see her as a, quite a, a kind, decent, selfless, selfless noble woman, and Krogstad, being a man, hasn't quite yet fully appreciated it. Um, he continues wringing his hands in kind of desperation, perhaps, that he's hated her all these years, and now suddenly he understands more about her motives, and says, so that was it, and all this only for the sake of money. Now, again, in terms of um, Ibsen's purpose, it's interesting here, because it's a reminder about the fact, the way in which society uh, is increasingly uh, dominated by money, is increasingly um, uh, motivated by it and corrupted by it. Um, I suppose, in a sense, we've talked earlier, haven't we, about the way in which we can see this play in some relation to A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol, of course, being a criticism in parts of the kind of capitalist, money-minded uh, interests of the Victorian 19th century period, um, obviously as represented by Scrooge. And I think once again in this play, there's further evidence we, um, about the, the influence that that has. And the fact that the Christmas time setting is again used in this play is again, I think, an interesting reference to that. So, um, there we are. Poor Krogstad is starting to realise about um, what actually happened. Um, Mrs. Lynn then goes on and says, You mustn't forget that I had a helpless mother and two little brothers. We couldn't wait for you, Niels. Your prospects seemed hopeless then. Again, others' interests before her own. And he continues, That may be so, but you had no right to throw me over for anyone else's sake. To throw me over meaning to dump. She replies, I really don't know. Often I used to ask myself if I had the right to do it. Krogstad replies more gently, as if finally he's beginning to understand and sympathise. And he says, when I lost you, it was as if all the solid ground went from under my feet. Look at me now. I am a shipwrecked man clinging to a bit of wreckage. Now, in terms of the character of Krogstad, that qu quotation is key. If we're talking about him not as an antagonist, but as a human who has been sinned against, we might actually use that phrase, more sinned against than sinning, um, that's crucial. That really wonderful metaphor that shows how he too is absolutely lost. Um, he too is trying to find his way in the world. Um, really powerful image, really crucial. Um, again, if we're talking about people suffering from inequality and you know economic disadvantage, but you know, it's, so it's important in a thematic way, but again, important to him as a character. She replied, "But help may be near." And he replies, "It was near, but then you came and stood in my way." In other words, um, uh, the fact that he thought that he had this good job at the bank, and obviously now she's lost it for him. She replies, unintentionally, Niels. It was only today that I learnt it was your place I was going to take in the bank. I believe you, if you say so. But now that you know it, are you not going to give it up to me? Now, it's not necessarily common, um, or not as common perhaps in plays of this time, um, but clearly this is fate, isn't it? The woman that um, was denied him happiness when he was a young man by not marrying him, seems about to deny him his continued happiness by taking his job from him. But we're going to see there's going to be a twist in this um, play. A pretty fanciful one, it has to be said, but a twist nonetheless. Now, Krogstad, with his typical hegemonic um, 19th century attitude, expects that she'll give the job back to him, and as a man, he will... Uh, continue to be the breadwinner for his family. But what Mrs. Lind has in mind is something very different. So, it continues then, and she says no, because that wouldn't benefit you in the least. 
Oh, benefit, benefit. I would have done it, benefit or not. I have learned to act prudently. Life and hard bitter necessity have taught me that. Again, if we're talking about uh, key quotations there, life and hard bitter necessity is a good one again, both for her character and for the plight of the working class or the, the, and the poorer characters in this novel. He goes on, still with this bitterness from the, all the wounds that he has suffered, and says, And life has taught me not to believe in fine speeches. She replies, Then life has taught you something very sensible. But deeds you must believe in. What do you mean by that? You said you were like a shipwrecked man clinging to some wreckage. I had good reason to say so. And here now, here is going to be the bombshell. Well, I am like a shipwrecked woman clinging to some wreckage. No one to mourn for, no one to care for. And so we start to see that these two characters, who were close once, perhaps can be close again. And of course, as we often see, the way in which she chooses to echo his own image here indicates the way I think that she's trying to reach out to him once again. Krogstad, still bitter, replies, it was your own choice. To which she replies, there was no other choice. Then, well, what now? Niels, how would it be if we two shipwrecked people could join forces? What are you saying? Two on the same piece of wreckage would stand a better chance than each on their own. Now, this, on the face of it, seems wonderful, because if Mrs. Lind can marry Krogstad, she will well, they'll keep the money in the family, Nora is safe and off the hook. This seems then, doesn't it, like it's going to offer us the prospect of a neat, well-made play style ending, a happy resolution. Now, you probably already gathered that this play is not going to be that simple. But at the moment, it suddenly seems like it's taking a turn in that direction. Things seem to be looking up. But there's a dilemma here. There's a question. Is Mrs. Lind telling the truth? She says in a second, what do you suppose brought me to town? The implication being that she came, after all these years, to seek out Krogstad. Now, is this true? Could be. On the other hand, what we could conceivably see here is a sacrifice on the part of Mrs. Lind. She sacrificed herself once for her family. Is she sacrificing herself again now to save Nora? And that would be a, a kind of fairly benevolent interpretation to save Nora as a friend and perhaps a benefactor. But from the benefactor point of view, does this actually not protect her own job? Is accepting this marriage to uh, Krogstad actually something um, that she is doing because she thinks that it will safeguard her position again? And it could well be the case. If we go back to that image about two people on the same piece of wreckage, it's interesting, isn't it, so that it's not you know two people arriving on dry land. Um, the sense that somehow they'll both be lost, and she doesn't think that actually this loss um, can get any um, is going to get any worse for her, but nor does it imply that it's going to make it much better. Um, it's almost as if you could argue she feels that her life has sunk so low that it almost wouldn't matter whether she marries Krogstad or not. So it's a real point of debate. Is this romantic? Is this, um, you know, is this sacrifice for a friend? Is it sacrifice for her own economic benefit? Difficult to say. Difficult to say, I think. Um, so, Krogstad is amazed at what she says and says, Christine, what do you suppose brought me to town? Do you mean that you gave me a thought? He can't believe it after he's hated her all these years. And she replies, I could not endure life without work. All my life, as long as I can remember, I have worked. There again, key quotations about her as a character, about um, lower status characters also um, and it has been my greatest and my only pleasure then obviously what a sad life she has had but now I am quite alone in the world 
My life is so dreadfully empty and I feel so forsaken. There is not the least pleasure in working for oneself. Niels, give me something and someone to work for. I don't trust that. It is nothing but a woman's overstrained sense of generosity that prompts you to make such an offer of yourself. Poor Krogstad, because of the life that he's led and the disappointments that he had, clearly um, is still sceptical. Um, personally, if I were Mrs Lind, I would be rather tempted to tell him where to get off. But for whichever of the reasons that we just mentioned, she can't do that. And so she presses on. Um, she says, have you ever noticed anything of the sort in me? And he replies, could you really do it? Tell me, do you know all about my past life? Yes. And do you know what they think of me here? You seem to me to imply that with me, you might have been quite another man. And so she's offering him the potential for redemption. He replies, I am certain of it. She says, is it too late now? Christine, are you saying this deliberately? Yes, I am sure you are. I see it in your face. Have you really the courage then? I want to be a mother to someone, and your children need a mother. We two need each other, Nils. I have faith in your real character. I can dare anything together with you. Now, let's unpack this. First of all, when she talks about she wants to be a mother, is this literally that she wants to have someone to look after and care for? Is it that she wants the sort of status and security that being in a family and being related to a man would give her? That's possible. And certainly when she talks about children needing a mother, that implies um, that this is not necessarily purely a romantic thing. And she repeats that idea. They need a mother. They need each other, she says, of she and Krogstad. Um, so I think that... Again, it emphasises that this is, this is a practical and a pragmatic relationship, in perhaps as much as it is a romantic one. Um, but then she, goes, she does go on and say, you know, she talks about faith in his character. She talks about how she can dare anything with him. So clearly, I think both pragmatics, i.e. both necessity and also romance, clearly plays a part. For these two characters, parted when young in such cruel situations, uh, cruel, cruel circumstances, Perhaps this then now is going to offer them both a redemption, both widowed, both um, in the middle of such sad lives. And poor Krogstad, whose cynicism has finally been defeated, grasps her hand and says, Thanks, thanks, Christine. Now I shall find a way to clear myself in the eyes of the world. Redemption again. But then he remembers the letter and says, ah, but I forgot, because of course he sent it, he doesn't know that it's still sitting in Torvald's letterbox. Mrs. Lind listens and says, hush, the Tarantella, go, go. Tarantella, of course, being the dance that Nora was to be doing in her fancy dress of this southern Italian kind of peasant costume, coming from the flat above. And he replies, obviously having no idea what this is about, why? What is it? He says, do you hear them up there? When that is over, we can expect them back. Yes, yes, I'll go. But it's all no use. Of course you don't know what steps I have taken in the matter of the helmet. And this is the thing you see now, because he thinks that maybe Mrs. Lind will not love him because he's tried to blackmail them. She then replies, yes. I know all about that. And he replies, And in spite of that, have you the courage to? She replies very generously, I understand very well to what lengths a man like you might be driven to despair. Again, it's a fantastic quotation for Krogstad, the character. It's a great description of what disempowered people, working class or poor people, might do when driven by necessity. Um, so she does understand this sympathy. Um, now, I suppose you could actually debate that it wouldn't matter whether she understood it or not if she is doing this um, 
out of an ability to save Nora. Um, but nonetheless, it kind of proves her love that she's prepared to go with, to redeem this man, even knowing the checkered life that he has um, led. He goes on and says, If only I could undo what I have done. And she replies, You cannot. Your letter is lying in the letterbox now. Are you sure of that? Quite sure, but with a searching look at her. Is that what it all means? That you want to save your friend at any cost? Tell me frankly, is that it? And so he starts to become suspicious that maybe she has had this ulterior motive um, for what she has said to him, that this whole thing might be that. And I mean, I suppose he might even be thinking that she might just be saying this to get the letter back and then she could turn around and say, actually, you know, JK didn't want to marry you after all. That must cross his mind. Um, so, she replies, though, I think, in um, a very uh, honest way and says, Niels, a woman who has once sold herself for another's sake doesn't do it a second time. And I think it's a fair and reasonable thing. And again, it shows the strength of Mrs. Lind, I think, as a character, and as a female character, that she has allowed society to dictate her life and her happiness once, and will not do so again. Um, so, Krogstad says, I will ask for my letter back, and she replies, No, no. Yes, of course I will. I will wait here till Helmer comes. I will tell him he must give me my letter back, that it only concerns my dismissal, that he must not read it. No, Nils, you must not recall your letter. But tell me, wasn't it for that very purpose that you asked me to meet you up here? In my first moment of fright it was, but twenty-four hours have passed since then, and in that time I have witnessed incredible things in this house. Helmer must know all about it. This unhappy secret must be disclosed. They must have a complete understanding between them, which is impossible with all this concealment and falsehood going on. Now, if a page ago this play suddenly seemed to be heading towards a happy ending, whoops, there's been another screeching turn, uh, and suddenly the idea that the letter is going to go to Torvald after all um, seems to threaten all that again. Um... And I suppose when Mrs. Lynn says that she thinks that it's important that the Helmers are finally honest with each other, she's clearly could be uh, talking benevolently in the sense that she thinks that that will actually help or save the marriage. Of course, if we were going to be cynical, we could be saying that perhaps she wants to punish them, uh, perhaps for the way that she's been treated. I don't think that's actually the case. Um... But again, as before, it's open for debate why um, she seems to be doing this. But I think we have to assume it's benevolent. Um, but henceforth, suddenly, the prospect of a happy ending that was dangled in front of us is now snatched away again. He replies, All right, if you will take the responsibility, but there is one thing that I can do in any case, and I shall do it at once. Mrs. Lind listens and says, You must be quick and go. The dance is over. We aren't safe a moment longer. He says, I'll wait for you below. Yes, do. You must see me back to my door. I have never had such an amazing piece of good fortune in my life. And he goes out through the outer door. The door between the room and the hall remains open. Now, of course, we know from our reading of um, Othello, from Romeo and Juliet, Fortune is a synonym for fate, and in a way it does feel like fate that these two lovers, torn apart when young, reunited in middle age, it does feel like a little bit of that. Um, but again, whether this is Ibsen saying it's an act of God, or whether this is Ibsen saying that it's economics um, and poverty and so on that have thrown them together, is also possible. Now... The final section then here, uh, we have Mrs. Lind tidying up the room and laying her hat and cloak ready, saying, what a difference, what a difference. 
someone to work for and live for, a home to bring comfort into, that I will do indeed. I wish they will be quick and come. And then she listens and says, Ah, there they are now. I must put on my things. And she takes up her hat and cloak. Um, and I suppose there we have it. If we were debating what her motives might have been, it seems to be that this little, very brief, rather fragmentary soliloquy serves to underline that her intentions were in fact benevolence and that's what we appear to see here that then concludes on page 55 in my copy uh, at the end of this first episode of act three